So as I mentioned earlier, Dr. Sue Ann Barrett is here with us. She's a lecturer at the Institute for Gender and Development Studies, and she'll be taking the spot talking about Caribbean feminism and the very many topics that have been buzzing around in the IGDS department. Welcome, Dr. Thank Barrett, who's also my sister, by the way. I'm hey, joking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank I you know, for having me. We were joking about it earlier, yeah. and then you said it's a topic for discussion as well. Definitely, and the reason why it's a topic for discussion, because some of the, the activities that we see displayed by men and women in our society are deeply rooted in persistent gendered ideologies. These ideologies are about undefinable things. It's very difficult to define masculinity without referencing femininity mm -hmm. and to define femininity without referencing masculinity. But what you have are these expectations. So men are, you know, sexual prowess, provider, powerful, protector. Women are nurturers, are submissive, etc. And these are belief systems. Mm -hmm. And so you see people seeking um, to engage in ways that will say, yes, I'm a real man. As my students sometimes say, big man tingness. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yes, but essentially, is that something for you? Is that your individual choice? Or is it that you're just trying to fit within this perception of what society expects? And so that's one of the things I think we need to be very aware of in this moment. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had a lot of conversations about gender, sex, and sexuality. We've had a lot of conversations, some of them aggressive, some of them appealing for connection and love, some of them appealing for understanding. And I think we at the IGDS would like to m just remind all of us that we are in a moment of hope, yes. of opportunity to take what may appear to be dysfunctional conflict to a functional place. So we seek understanding, we talk about things that we have difficulty understanding because these gender ide ideologies shape intimate partner violence, mm -hmm. shapes phobias and isms of many types, shapes inequalities in terms of pay and access and availability, and also shapes how people respond on social media, yes. which is kind of one of the, the platforms that we see a lot of them re-emerging mm -hmm. as dangerous and, and sometimes damaging to women especially, but to men as well, to people in general. And so I think that we really want to reinforce that this is an ongoing process. It's difficult to understand the things you take for granted, that you never question, that you're never skeptical about. But we have to seek understanding with each other, especially at this time, yes. where men are not just men. Women are not just women. We are people. And we are people who make choices. And we should be free to then live our lives as whole people, mm -hmm. not just roles. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you mentioned that women, that notion um, mm -hmm. or perception of women being submissive. Mm -hmm. But are we, are women really still submissive? Because most of the times when you talk to even um, men in relationships, they're yes. so afraid to mention certain, certain things to yes. women. Yes. For instance, even on the radio just yesterday, I was hearing an incident where a young man would have dreamt his ex-girlfriend from years before, and he's afraid to tell uh, this to his current girlfriend because of the manner in which she would react and she would, you know, throw a fit and that sort of thing. Let me, that's a great question because we have inherited as women the work of our mothers and grandmothers. So we have a lot of opportunities. We work, we operate in the public space, we have a voice and so forth. The ideology of submissiveness and nurturing and subordination and so forth comes to bear when we have instances of violence, when we have instances of freedom and limitation of self, when we have instances of your value as a worker, a laborer in a capitalist system. What do I mean by that? So for example, we've heard a lot of cases where somebody said, you know, I had to do so and so to her because I didn't want to be shamed. I didn't want to be, um, I didn't want someone to say that I, my woman is in control. And you mm -hmm. see where those ideas yes. still buzz underneath. You may see it in the workplace where a woman comes in to do the similar job and they say, well, you know, you are uh, in your childbearing years or yes. you don't have the family wage burden, therefore we're not going to pay you the same, the same amount. And this is global, this, mm -hmm. this, this ideology. So it's not that women don't have access, that you can't do whatever you want. Yeah, we're super agentic. But at the same time, we still find ourselves boxed in. And just to give you an, um, an indication of how this stays relevant, um, recently, there was a qualitative study of 
intimate partner violence in Trinidad and Tobago. Prevalence study, the quantitative, we could all, you could look up, you know, you could look at statistics. Yes. But the qualitative element is that these ideologies disempower and empower. So at once you act in resistance, but they retain these ideas about who should be, who can have extramarital um, relations, who can have multiple partners, who can speak back in a relationship, who can make decisions about money. These ideas are reinforced by religion, all religions, I'm not picking anyone, yes. by um, m m certain ideas about normative behavior, so a man must be strong, therefore, you know, no discussion is necessary, I shall be the strong, silent type, and some women expect that as well. Mm -hmm. I don't want no man who like too much discussion. What happened? What happened? <laughs> what happened? So exactly. <laughs> so those things, in very subtle ways, mm -hmm. serve to make us complicit. So we are not necessarily persistently submissive, and some of us are very much privileged and quite happy, right? But at the same time, we find ourselves. We could even take it to street harassment. We could take it to the carnival debate about who you mm -hmm. can whine on <laughs> and all of the male entitlement that emerge. We see these moments where these things then come back and, and are relevant. And so we always have to take everything from the multiple sides that affect our lives. Yes. Because our mothers and grandmothers didn't you know, enjoy the things that we now enjoy, but they worked very hard. We're not in a 1960s moment. But in a 2018 moment, you have to deal with subtleties mm -hmm. and seek understanding yes. at all times. Now, with the recent developments we've had, and, and mm -hmm. you know what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to really get yes. too deep into it, but yes. um, where are we now in terms of gender? I think where we are at is we are at a hopeful place, as I said. We are at a place where we start to understand that human beings are, in fact, dynamic, variable, and changeable. Mm -hmm. We also, some people have an indication, though fear mediates how we are able to respond, an indication that the thing that I thought I knew, I didn't really know, and I know more. So there is this idea that you have to expand what you know. One of your earlier interviewers talked about how we resist the thing that we thought we didn't know, yes. but based on what yes. we think we know. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was a really valuable point for everything in life, because this is where we're at in gender. Gender is a space it's, a, it's one of those social justice spaces where we, there's a lot of conflict because we're coming to terms with the fact that people are not how they've been defined but in very specific ways. Mm -hmm. That people may be multiple genders, multiple sexualities, perform multiple roles, and these may be based on consenting adults deciding what they want for themselves and their relationship. And so I think that growth is happening. Okay. Learning is taking place. And learning is taking place because people are resisting that learning. But as much as you would have people who are resisting, so that means the, you know, the discourse is there. As much as you have people resisting such learning, there are those who are able to sit and contemplate and reflect. I always tell anyone who's new to gender and gender-related issues, you don't have to change how you think right away about anything. Okay. In fact, what you have to do is reflect on what you see and how you live, and then see what is, what, what's rational to me. And then you move on from there, because the phobias and the isms and the ideologies can say, don't think about it. It's everything is gonna go crazy. Everybody's gonna destroy the world, save whomever. Yeah. And we don't wanna get into the specifics, yeah. but you see, this is where we're like, okay, people are learning. Okay. And I think that's a really good, a really good opportunity. So you've identified some sort of progress within Trinidad and Tobago as Definitely. it pertains to the developments as it pertains to gender equality and the various developments that we've had. Yes, I have. I think we have. You know, I think that we see signs from our state that we're responding to gender justice and the rights of all peoples, um, however small that may be perceived by the different parties in our society. I think I see that people are willing to share their views um, through what is uh, almost a revolutionary medium, social media, yes. people have an opportunity and they're not so afraid. Even though there is some backlash and sanction, people feel a little more free. And then they are willing to engage in arguments. And sometimes these arguments will really lead to resolves. Other times it does not, as mm -hmm. we would accept. But that keeps the conversation going. And on that vein, this is why we're inviting people to come together in June mm -hmm. 27th, 29th to talk about how they're engaging in social justice activism, gender activism, online, 
all trying to achieve some sense of equality and equity. So, of course, people who engage in this, be in this activity are cyber feminists. And it's not a bad word. It's nothing to be afraid of. It's that you recognize that all people are people. And we want people to come together and say, moving from this place of, of opportunity and hope, how do we make this sustainable? Great. We'd like to continue this conversation after this short break. We have a lot to talk about as it pertains to the developments and all the, the different uh, activities and developments that have been taking place as it pertains to gender and social justice. And uh, we'd like to continue that conversation this sure. morning. As I mentioned during the break, um, in a recent Spanish course, um, mm -hmm. you know, we were talking about uh, Spanish, of course, being having the masculine and the feminine. And now with these uh, different changes going on globally, uh, how does that affect these languages, the Romance languages, the love languages, and languages in general? And English especially, yes. as lingua franca. Uh, let me just backtrack a little and say gender, as a social concept, was in fact taken from linguistics. Uh, we have linguistic gender, masculine forms, he, she, mm -hmm. feminine forms, and the third person, plural. And that has existed in a lot of languages, and we'd also have it expanding in different ways. This is not a linguistic course this morning. <laughs> But gender was adapted because it was well placed to describe our social selves beyond the biological. Because people then enact so many different ways of being feminine or masculine. And some people are neither, and they, and they become a point of confusion. Language does a powerful thing. It's our tools of meaning. This is how we know what we mean. This is how we know, hey, we, we connect and we make sense. And so we, we are patient with ourselves and each other when we try to discuss and identify and name and describe different types of people. I think because language is a system that's subject to change, if we want to understand variation that we're not familiar with, mm -hmm. you see somebody you ask respectfully, okay. how do you identify? What pronoun do you wish to use? Do you wish to use masculine, feminine, or third person plural? Do you wish to use nothing in particular, okay. um, to be unidentified. And this way, if you do so respectfully, as I said earlier, we maintain understanding. So I say, OK, this is, this is your way of self-identifying. I respect that, and I use that, because then we can have meaning. Because we appreciate that our language system is according to a certain code, and it has not yet expanded. Mm -hmm. But we are finding nuanced ways to reflect what people live and how people live. In addition to that, I must say that language infuses the power and the ideologies that are there. So every time we attempt to you know, initiate a change, we will be responding to the dominant ideologies about what can be. Language names the world and, and, and makes it material for us in our understanding. So it is difficult, I appreciate, and I think we all do appreciate, because people find ways of saying, well, then what do I say? Like, what is going to happen? Mm -hmm. You simply ask. Okay. How do I use, like, you know, you're learning your language and you're conjugating your verbs. Yes. It's the same way you ask, how do you wish to identify? And it applies to other things like race. It applies to other things like class, et cetera. I mean, imagine race and ethnicity. Yeah. You ask somebody so you don't assume, because we have so much mixedness, for yes. example, in the Caribbean space. And you say, so how, how do you identify? Because then people live these multicultural, nuanced, exciting lives. I think it's really exciting. Mm -hmm. I think it's great that we could, you know, join and, and, and form, form um, connections. But language is the means to meaning. Have you ever seen V for Vendetta? No, I haven't. There is a scene in that movie that I find profound where he said, words are the means to meaning, the power of truth making. And I said, oh my God, truth. Because that is exactly what language does now. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the language about everything that's been happening so far from earlier into the year to now, both conflict and pleasant, yes. there are a lot of things that are steeped within the limits of words to express our feelings, our fears, our perspective. And we, we assert meanings that reflect misunderstanding, misinformation, and not necessarily a belief system that is not subject to question. No, I didn't say change. Yes. Questioning. Mm -hmm. So this is the importance of language, essentially. Great. So we mentioned in the earlier segment, just before the break, that uh, this conference mm -hmm. is taking place on June 27th through to yes. the 29th. What's on the agenda? Okay, on the agenda, we have two main 
elements. We have, on the first day, we have uh, an open discussion, a keynote presentation by one of our colleagues from the Cavill campus, uh, Dr. Tanya Haynes. She is uh, one of the leading researchers on Caribbean feminism and, of course, social media activism in terms of feminist movement building and consciousness raising. So we are really pleased to share that space with her. We also have a kind of an archival project where people who are involved in gender justice activism online, especially, or just um, contemporary Caribbean feminisms, can come together and share their views in short videos because they're operating in the social media space. People want, you know, a minute, a 30 seconds, or two minutes, or whatever length to talk about what are we attending to, what are some of our concerns, be it gender-based violence, be it, you know, street harassment, be it um, equality, economic um, insecurity, all of these factors. Whatever your work is in, you can come and we bring it together to, to compile that as part of a making of Caribbean Feminisms project. On the second day, we have a master class with one of the leaders, leading social media scholars and bestseller, uh, Dr. Jolina Sinanon, and she is sharing time with us during that time in, in Trinidad and will talk with these activists and researchers how do we make this work sustainable? How do we have a conversation with other social justice activists, be they in the realm of race and other society, politics, etc.? And we invite people to come and, and question and ask where are we now in a more you know in a more elaborated way, what does 21st century activism look like? What does 21st century feminist activism look like? How are young people contending with the inheritances from our parents and our and our grandparents, etc. And then on the final day, after we've engaged in that masterclass, we have an open forum. It will take place online and in person and in and on location on campus and that is where we say okay we map our way forward we say this is where we want to go this is what we want to see for our country trans Tobago, the rest of the caribbean this is where we want to see our people going mm -hmm. this is how we see opportunities emerging this is where we assert we assert our commitment because we have to do it you know sometimes people ask us what are you doing about so and so if a woman is dead what are we doing about so and so if something happens and we say hey we've been doing this for years mm -hmm. and we continue to do it so here's a space where people can then come to take the advantages of media and the advantages of user generated content and all of these platforms to keep the ball rolling to try to change some of those persistent ideologies that reinforce detrimental things on people's lives. Who is invited to this conference? Anyone who is involved in social justice activism, free gender, sex, and sexuality is invited to join us. If you're not online and you're engaged in feminist activism or activism, you may not identify as a feminist, but you are engaged with issues of gender, sex, and sexuality, you're also welcome to come. And other members of the public who are willing to learn, as I said, we at the IGDS are committed to having those conversations that encourage understanding, mutual understanding and respect. So if you want to come in, you're curious, you're like, you know, I want to really understand this. If you're a religious person, if you are uh, a health worker, if you are a counselor, whatever you may be, I want to understand this because I'm dealing with things every day in my work. You're welcome to come and hear the conversation because you hear it from the people who are working in it. Mm -hmm. And so you get to see a different perspective rather than the perception that, um, I'm seeing some sort of sensationalized vision of what has been long years of hard work for gender justice. Great. Uh, in our final two minutes, I'd like mm -hmm. to ask, you know, you mentioned uh, people who are victims of street harassment mm -hmm. and gender-based violence, mm -hmm. but then would these people attend this conference? You wouldn't believe yes. What we have observed is these spaces, especially the Open, open Symposium on Friday, give people an opportunity to test, to give their testimony, to give experiential information. And we, and we know that anecdotal evidence, though, does not make statements about prevalence or anything. What it does is give us an insight. Mm -hmm. So somebody can come in and say, this is how I've experienced it. This is how I understand. This is the realness of the problem for me. Just because you don't live it, please don't assume that I don't live it. Mm -hmm. And people come and give you details. They share their stories. They share their passions. So people do come and they're welcome and I really appreciate that because what it does is give us an indication of I need to see beyond my own perspective. But then what about the, vic the not the victims but yeah. the perpetrators? <laughs> well, that's a more difficult. Yeah. 
First of all, the person who perpetrates needs to see themselves as perpetrating something. This is the power of the ideology. If you think this is normative, if you say, you know, somebody came up to me and I have respect for the individual um, about something that happened, I don't understand why I can't give a woman a compliment. And I said to him, there's a difference between a compliment and something that is, is deemed as threatening. Let me do it to you. Let me give you an example. And then he stopped for a moment and said, oh, I see what you mean. So again, for him to see, oh, I'm per perpetrating something that's wrong or something that's undermining somebody else's agency, it, they need to understand this. So again, that person has to be recovering, not so much steeped in the ideology that says, well, I can do whatever I want. Yes. Yeah. Great. So as we wrap this interview, um, yeah. just to remind us, that inter that conference takes place June 27th through to the 29th. Yeah. Where is it? At the, at, at the University of the West Indies. Our final venue we will announce on social on, online on our mm -hmm. website. You just go to sta.ue.edu or just search IGDS SDA on, you know, on Google. It will come up very quickly. So it will take place on campus, but you also have the opportunity to be remote, to rem have remote okay. access and take place and participate online. Mm -hmm. And through it, you will enter through our, our, our website, of course. And that will be for the three days. You can choose, you know, people are busy. You can choose to participate for one day or two days. The keynote will be open on Facebook Live to everyone. So as many people as uh, has a time to look, yes. they can hear what Dr. Haynes has to say about where we're at and where we're going. And we welcome as many people who want to join the conversation as Great. possible. Such a pleasure chatting with you, Thank Dr. Suan Barrett. Well, we now take you to our travel weather forecast.